Hey everybody, Mark here. Thanks so much for tuning in. And we are continuing the conversation about is the Bible reliable? We're also going to give some more space and some resources to try to help us all understand and process what's happening right now at the conflict in the Middle East, as well as continue to pull on the thread of how to love others that might not see 100% eye to eye with us or agree with us. So very helpful podcast today, very insightful, lots of tips for you. So we hope that you enjoy that. Before we jump in, I just want to say thank you to those that said hi over the weekend at the Spiritual Formation Retreat and at some of the campuses I've been visiting. It's so great to see you all in person. And so I really value those relationships that we have in those conversations. And if you would like to continue to support or get involved with this podcast, you can text us at 650-600-04. O2. We can't do what we do here without people like you volunteering your time or your resources. And there are plenty of spots for you if you want to get involved with helping us reach the Bay Area for God through a digital ministry. This would be a great way for God to work in you and through you. So that is something that you want to talk more about, I would love to chat with you. And we have some great people on the team already that are willing to come alongside you and help you in that process. So again, reach out to us at that number. And now let's go ahead and jump into the podcast. Well, hey, everybody. My name is Mark. My name is Jessica. And Phil's with us today. Woo. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the Menlo Midweek Podcast. We're doing We're it. I was going to start today thinking about fall and that fall is here. But <laughs> as I was leaving, I was looking at the weather. And it's going to be like no. 77 yeah. today. Really I was like, okay, yeah. we got to touch that conversation back a little bit. It's going to be like 86 on Thursday. Bit. Yeah. Is it really? It's going to yeah. be really hot again. Yeah. If you're listening in the Midwest and yep. you have just a nice, cool <laughs> fall week, yep. just pray for us. You yeah. know, it's tough. It's tough. They're like, tough okay. We're making sacrifices <laughs> out here. Yeah, we're, we're going to make it. But Although going, like planning to ride my bike in when it's 57 degrees yeah, and yeah, leaving yeah. when it's 77. Feels great, right? That's, a, that's yeah, it kind of does, except yeah. I'm kind of cold when I get in. I don't know. I'm really sorry about that. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll get you some mittens. Would that help? I do, I do have mittens and one of those like neck gator things, oh, yeah, yeah. but nice. I'm waiting until it's like actually kind of sure, cold sure. To do it. Yeah. I do feel like yeah. 60 is kind of the breaking point. It like is. north of 60, mm -hmm. if you have any kind of distance on your bike, it's actually really nice that it's that cool. Mm -hmm. But sub 60, it really like, I feel like I never totally get warm on a ride. Like right. I'm, I'm a little bit cold the whole time. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm the same way. Uh, I got to talk with a lot of people at the retreat this past weekend. That's Ooh, yeah. right. A lot of you mentioned that you love this podcast and you love that we're putting this Yay. out. So thank you so much for listening. Woo. Yeah. You guys are awesome. Uh, and I was given some feedback, which I think was very appropriate. Oh, yes. okay. They're like, quit shouting things out in Menlo Park specifically. Oh, yes. We need other recommendations I from other too. places. Totally fair. And I am so on board with that. So I'm going to give a shout out to a new coffee shop in San Carlos. Okay. Uh, it's on San Carlos Ave, and it's called the Groovy Goose. I know this restaurant. Have you been there? No, but my okay. roommate who used to work here, Sam Littlefield, yeah. her friends own that restaurant Stop. or coffee shop. Friends of the show. Uh huh. Groovy <laughs> Goose. No, is what it's the called. Groovy it's Goose. called the Groovy Goose. Yeah, just right in downtown. Let's they go. needed. Uh, they needed a coffee shop there. There's. I, I, I always associated San Carlos with pizza and pizza only because they had like Patsy's and Blue Line oh. and like so many pizza spots <laughs> on that. So it was pizza That's and funny. no Alani's Hawaiian food. Like those are the two mm. things that were there. And now that they do have a cool coffee shop. I will say next spot. door to that is Drake's, which is a really good okay. restaurant. They've got excellent breakfast food. They do trivia some nights. Nice. It's pretty fun. It's a beautiful restaurant as well. Yes. Yeah. I think I've been so to this coffee shop actually. It's only been open for a couple months. Yeah, it's pretty new. But yeah. yeah. All right, San Carlos. Way to go, San Carlos. Yeah. yeah. Text on, us in your recommendations to oh, other yeah. mm -hmm. other uh, cities, places yep. that mm -hmm. we should check out. We yep, can yep. shout out. Yeah. We'd love yep. to start highlighting yeah. some things. And I think, and be on the lookout on socials too. We're going to start highlighting some events that are going on in the community. Yeah. Ooh. For free fall Halloween stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, so a lot of the cities are doing some really cool movie nights for families that are free yeah. or trick-or-treat, trunk-or-treat kind of events. So be on the lookouts for those. Well, too. we are Cl also doing one here. We are. So trick-or-treat extravaganza mm -hmm. is going to happen at all of our campuses from 4 to 6 on Saturday, October 28, I think is the Saturday. It's the same day and same time at every campus? It is. That's awesome. Whoa. How easy. It's That's glorious. so good to remember. So definitely check wow. that out. Go to menlo.church slash Halloween. They're also looking for volunteers. If you can't be there or if yep. you can, you can donate candy. Yeah. Bring that. Uh, and it, those are super fun. And they're just 
you don't even have to have kids. Just come and hang out and yeah, just come and get some out. candy. Mm-hmm. That's so fun. And there's other stuff happening too, but <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? You could say that is both unity and uniformity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is how we started our message this past yeah, yeah. week. <laughs> but that unity doesn't mean uniformity. Correct. Just right. A, exactly. Right. Yeah. Just to differentiate yeah. Yeah, there. Yeah. Um, but we were talking about and, and continuing this series on Explore God. And um, I think before we dive into that, you talked about it a little bit in your message, too. Um, and this has been heavy on our hearts, heavy on hearts of those that have been with us uh, or just existing in the reality that we're in, in this broken world, um, with what's going on in Israel right now. So I'd love to give some space, Phil, yeah, yeah. F- for you, maybe some resources that you can shout out for people to better help discern what's happening. Yeah, I mean, I think um, anytime there's something happening around the world, there is, I think, um, I, I want to be careful. I think there is a temptation out of a performative sense of, look at us, we're doing something and saying something, mm-hmm. to just like throw something up, you know, yep. like image, mm-hmm. statement, video. Um, and I think I resist that pretty strong because I'm not always sure that, A, it's helping. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm also not sure that we're always the best people to add voice to it. Mm-hmm. And I also think that sometimes there's space that's necessary and helpful Um so I understand if you're listening and you're like, but how are we supposed to think about it? So last week we shared a podcast on social media from a podcast called The Bulletin. It's produced by Christianity Today. They did a bonus episode last week, basically just trying to catch you up on the Israeli-Palestinian relationship over the last, let's call it, 50 years. And if you're unfamiliar with that and you're just kind of letting social media mm-hmm. feed the way you think about this, I'll just say your views are likely misinformed. Mm. Um, and it was so kind and charitable in the conversation, and I think nuanced in a way that didn't just say, uh, here is the very basic, easy way to understand this. This is an intractable conflict that I would say has a spiritual dimension and has been going on for millennia. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that if you have a simple solution to solve that problem, um, your solution is likely not sufficient for the problem. Uh, so, you know, if you think about mm-hmm. what we're anticipating, and even maybe by the time you're listening to this, there may be a ground invasion taking place in Gaza. Um, the, like, loss of life, we none of us should be cheering that on. Like, that's an awful... Yeah. And, and what uh, the terrorist group Hamas did uh, is such an indefensible um, atrocity... No one should be trying to find a, a sense of moral equivalency. Well, because the experience of Gazans has been so bad for so long, therefore they had to. No, 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 no. That's has Israel been overly restrictive to a region for specific region reasons in their national interest? Yes, absolutely. Is that awful? Of course. Does it justify the behavior of a terrorist organization? Absolutely not. Hmm. And so I, I think this is just one of those conversations that as Christians sometimes we feel a sense in which. We're not allowed to hold two things in tension to be true at once. Um, I believe that God still has a unique plan for Israel. Um, I also think that that does not justify every behavior of Israel. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's okay to say both of those things. So, But I, I also know that even me just saying that is going to be triggering for some people. So I, I want to recognize the fact that I'm not a Middle East uh, expert. Um, uh, also... Uh, we are incredibly honored that Connalisa Rice is a part of our church, and uh, last week uh, she did a podcast with, um, I'm sure we can link it in the show notes, mm-hmm. somebody named Barry Weiss, who uh, puts on a podcast called Honestly. It is not a Christian podcast, um, but she was interviewing Connalisa Rice kind of around the geopolitical underpinnings of why we're here, and Connalisa Rice is, is brilliant and very, very thoughtful, uh, so that may be another place to go, not overtly Christian, uh, but Condoleezza Rice is a, is a faithful follower of Jesus, and uh, I think her perspective is, is certainly worth considering. So as you're praying for that region, I think we're just regularly praying for peace, right? Mm-hmm. We have an uh, intractable war that's millennia long. Uh, we have it with people that live in a region who, by the way, are not the same as Hamas. Hamas is a terrorist organization. Their leaders regularly use some of the worst and indefensible acts as a part of their terrorist activities. They're using civilian buildings uh, with with civilians as human shields on purpose. And so if you're like, why is Israel 
you know, committed to de destroying this because it's simultaneously the headquarters of Hamas uh, in the region and um, civilian homes and hospitals. And uh, it's that way on purpose by, by Hamas. And so, you know, the, one of the reasons that lots of people think they're sort of delaying the invasion is they're trying to communicate to as many people as possible to get out. Um, and there's, you know, lots of mixed uh, information taking place in the region about who's doing what. But uh, Egypt, which shares a border, is not allowing people out uh, into Egypt. And so right now you have lots of international um, pressure being applied to Egypt to let people in. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the same time, you have the uh, really key leaders of Hamas who are not in Gaza. They're actually outside of Gaza entirely. Uh, and so this to them, there's kind of pawns, you know, like mm -hmm. people that live there that are going to be impacted by this are pawns to this awful uh, act of terror. And then you have the sort of bigger socioeconomic geopolitical implications of Russia and Ukraine, China, Iran. Um, and so, again, if, if your reading of this is very simple, I would just argue you're not reading close enough. And um, those two resources that Christianity Today podcast and then... Um, the Honestly podcast with Condoleezza Rice and Barry Weiss are, are worth your attention. Um, and if you're not regularly thinking about and praying for the people that are uh, in the Middle East right now, you should be. Um, but I would just say this is an opportunity for you, if you're a follower of Jesus in America, uh, we are very ethnocentric in the way we think about the world. I have friends that live overseas, and you know the kinds of conflicts that exist, mm -hmm. uh, we have just sort of a compassion fatigue and it's very easy for something to kind of be in the headlines and then move on. Be in the headlines, make a statement, move on. Be in the headlines, make a post, move on. And uh, the heart of God never moves on from mm. the atrocities of the world, and, and I don't think mm. ours should either. So uh, letting, letting ourselves sit in lament, letting ourselves sit in the pain of the moment here, uh, I think is uh, absolutely warranted given what's taking place around the world. Mm. That's good. I feel like I was going to ask... Um, what does help look like for us? But I think for a lot of us, acknowledging that, sitting in that lament and sitting in the, um, trying to, I, I love that compassion fatigue too. I think that's really interesting. Um, I think in those moments of reflection, we will see how God is leading us to act whatever way that will be for people, whether that's donating, whether that's praying, whether that is learning more or fasting from social media. I don't know. Could look like a lot of different things. Yeah, I mean, I think the the kind of start and stop exercise that I would encourage people to do, um, I would just say stop. Every time you think about uh, a performative post just so that people know that you're really awesome, just say don't make that post. Mm -hmm. Just don't make that post. Um, and then I think the thing to start, you have no idea uh, the impact it could have if when you are sitting around a table at lunch with colleagues or... Uh, when you, even with Christian friends, they just start popping off about something and it's very poorly informed. Mm -hmm. When you uh, kindly and clearly um, communicate context, kindly and clearly communicate context that maybe they don't know, not to put them down, not to be mean, um, but if we can just share kind, clear context and truth to people in the midst of something like this, mm -hmm. hopefully, especially as Christians, we can be seen as not, because, you know, we know the stereotype. The stereotype is that, well, if you're a Christian, Israel can do no wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So, obviously, we're pro-Israel, let them do whatever they want, send over whatever they need, um, and it is more nuanced than that. Like, mm -hmm. it just is, and so uh, we can say uh, terrorism is awful, and we want to um, do whatever we can to end it. Um, and we can say not all behavior of Israel is positive, and we can root for peace in the region, and we can be forces for peace in our own lives, even in the conversations related to this. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, yeah, it's it's a wild, it's a wild moment to watch uh, the groups that have chanted pro Hamas um, rhetoric on college campuses a handful of miles from where we're recording right now. Mm -hmm. That. Uh, I, I don't have a category for what's happening in our culture and for us as exiles in Babylon to be uh, voices for good, hope, peace, and truth, I think is more important than ever. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's good. Yeah. yeah. We have to hold a lot of things in tension there. Right. Um, there has to be a, a shift in allowing two or three things to be true at once without discrediting the other. 
and that's just so hard to do now in this moment that we're in and a lot of people i mean kind of pivoting back to what we talked about last weekend is when we are going through something like the bible trying to hold two or three different views on it or trying to be like you 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 spelled out very well a spectrum of how people view the bible in itself and in both camps there right. you have to hold different things in tension at different times sure and so can we just for a minute recognize mm -hmm. how masterful that transition I was just, i was like, like oh my gosh it's happening it's like Segway watching a superhero King, tie on the honestly. cape right over there holy <laughs> smokes well it all ties together we're, we're, it does, we're talking you about see it and it's great mm -hmm. discerning truth discerning right, help right. discerning how to receive information yeah and what to do with it and that's exactly what we talked about this past weekend mm -hmm. and totally. so phil could you run us through your message from last weekend and then we can dive in yeah so obviously we've been in this like longer conversation answering sort of some big questions uh and this one i think there's just an easy write-off that people can have around the bible and so the the question of is the bible reliable um you know i, I do think that we sometimes if we grew up in church, we had we started with a very simplistic approach, right? God said it, that settles it, move on. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think trying to understand that, of course, there's more nuance than that. Like, of, of course, even if that's true, by the way, like how we understand and read it is really important. And, um, you know, like I'm a like very theologically conservative person. And so when I think about the Bible, if you're a super nerdy Christian, right, I think the Bible is inerrant infallible inspired in so much as it reflects the original autographs like that's a that's a phrase that has existed for a lot of years um and i believe it and <laughs> i think that there's this really big spectrum informed by the text itself uh and so i tried to just give a little bit of a look into that uh anytime i talk about the bible you're going to hear me use this phrase right the bible is not the foundation mm -hmm. of our faith uh, the resurrection of Jesus is the foundation of our faith. The reason that I know that is because among the fastest moments in church um, history of more and more people rapidly following Jesus existed before Tabiblia, existed before the Bible. So Jesus resurrects, everybody's already figuring out how to go back to their day job. A resurrected Jesus walks in, says, I am back. And they're like, amazing, start the church, Holy Spirit comes we watch this incredible move of God, not because the Bible that didn't exist yet was the foundation of their mm -hmm. faith, but because the resurrection of Jesus was their faith, because it validated everything that he had said. And so uh, I think when we, uh, when we see the Bible through the lens of this is not the foundation, it is the authority for my faith, I think it doesn't diminish what it is. I think it just allows much greater freedom in this conversation. And so all of a sudden, somebody that interprets that passage different than me or interprets that passage different from me. I do think that there are still essentials, and we can get into those, like what are those theological essentials? That's why different uh, denominations exist. That's why different um, kind of subsets of Christianity, if you will, exist. Um, but I, I think ultimately being able to sort of roll it back and say, what's the big story of the Bible? Let's make sure we don't lose the plot uh, as we think about the individual things that maybe are tricky. Um, because we, you know, I talked about these objections, right? The Bible's full of contradictions, full of violence and genocide, often condoned or commanded by God. Mm -hmm. Descriptions of nature and history are at odds with science. It's written by ignorant and ancient people who have no relevance to us, and Christians can't even agree on what it's saying. Um, like, those are very normal, right? Like, those are things that lots of people experience. And without any sort of theological framing... You just open up to the text. Yeah, I can open you up to some really awful things that you're like, wait a second, God said to do that? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think just like the rest of our faith matures over time, but it doesn't discredit our faith, it actually strengthens it. I would say our understanding and experience of the text of Scripture can grow and mature over time. It doesn't undermine it. It actually strengthens it. That was the whole premise, pretty much, of our summer series, The right, Rest exactly of the Story. Right. If you mm -hmm. don't grow, if let me see if I can remember this. You got this. If you don't grow up, nope, I lost it. <laughs> that was close. It was close. If yeah. you don't grow up with your faith, you'll grow out of your faith. Something just like that. Something like yep, that, yep, yeah. Great job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I mean, we didn't. We knew this series was coming, but this series, as we've talked about, is a series that I think 165 Bay Area churches are doing with us. So we didn't frame these questions. The folks building the series did. We're writing our own sermons. I didn't take a script from anybody. Um, but 
that that is an interesting overlap, right? Because mm-hmm. really, this was kind of the the bigger conversation all summer. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I liked how you started with an analogy or a a story about how your parents mm-hmm. went from superheroes to oh, there's they're more they're mere they're, mortals. They're mere yeah. mortals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and a lot of times for us, the Bible becomes that too. Right. And so, as you said, how to how to let that mature with you and have that approach. And so as a, as a communicator, as a speaker, you have a lot of different people sitting in the room. You have people that have probably sat with the Bible for twice as long as you've been alive, right. and you have people that are there for the first time. So with an audience that wide, how do you approach something like, is the Bible reliable? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, maybe I've, I've mentioned these audiences before, but in my head, the way I kind of break up, you have... Lot you know, infinite different categories at a place like Menlo. Lots of people that I don't even get to look at. Maybe you're watching online or you're at a campus, um, and so I'm I'm regularly trying to remember and hear stories and be in context where people are that that are a part of Menlo. Um, but I think at the highest level, uh, maybe I've said this before. There's kind of the saints, the people that are just trying to faithfully follow Jesus, and a lot of them at Menlo have been doing it for a long time. Mm-hmm. You have the skeptics. And they're going, I'm not really sure about faith or God. You know, I got here because somebody invited me. I got here because life's not going well, and I'm not sure this is the answer, but I know what I've been trying isn't. And then you have prodigals. And prodigals are those people that say, hey, I grew up in church. Uh, Faith for me was important for a long time, but it hasn't been in a long time. Am I still welcome back? Right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of the underlying question that they're asking. Mm -hmm. And they all have a different set of underlying, underlying questions um, I think all of them bring those questions with them to every sermon. And I think every sermon, if you get those three, every sermon you kind of have a different one that's the the first priority, a third priority, second priority, and it changes. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I think mm-hmm. a series like this, um, and I sort of named it actually this weekend, Yeah. Um, but I think a series like this, I'm very, very thankful that kind of the saints will let us do a series where I say, hey, just so you know, we're going with skeptic first, we're going prodigal second, mm-hmm. and we're going saints third. And we don't do it all the time, mm-hmm. but we're going to do it for this series. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I talked about the resources that we've been recommending. It's been so encouraging for me to hear people who are diving into those resources who have no faith, who actually have never had, mm-hmm. like, a personal faith in Jesus at all in their life, and how helpful it's been for them, mm-hmm. all the way to the other side of saints who are following Jesus for a long time. And this is what I would say, uh, the most faithful saints are the deepest learners. You know, they don't assume they have it figured out. And so they'll come to me and they've forgotten about more about the Bible than I'll ever know. Mm. And they're saying, "Hey, I just want you to know I read that book you recommended. It was so helpful in my life." And th- like th- this wasn't about I need know somebody that needs to they're just saying God did something in my life with it. And uh, I have a grandchild I'm going to talk to about it. Mm. Uh, I have a coworker that mm. we're, it's really helping in mm-hmm. conversations with. And I just think that when we talk about what does it mean to have a burden for people who are close to me but far from the faith that God died to provide, um, that's so encouraging to me. And so I, I think there is a sort of a contextual framing that those three help you with. And then you can get into who walked in this week really excited and encouraged, who walked in this week really discouraged, who's got a diagnosis that they don't know what's next for, uh, who's got a kid in trouble that they feel powerless to address, whose financial reality just came crashing down, who is near the end of their life reflecting back on a legacy they wish they could change, who is starting their life that it's going, I, I'll worry about a legacy later because I'm going to live forever. You have all these other things that sort of make up the mosaic mm-hmm. of a room or a, a number of rooms at Menlo or folks that are watching online And I think that ultimately one of the things that I believe so importantly about the text, we talked about it from the book of Hebrews, um, is that ultimately I'm just setting the table for the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Um, That, you know, I'm going to do my very best, but I have no illusions that I'm going to be able to meet the needs of everyone that walks into a a room at Menlo or tunes in online each week. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ultimately, that's going to be the Lord. And I know it happens when somebody comes up to me and they go, man, I just feel like you are talking right to (laughs) me. And I'm like, that wasn't me. you know. (laughs) Uh, And I think there's just some... Uh, there's, There's something so important about the way that as we read the text or we study the text... God wakes something up in us from it, um, you know, that even though we're fallen, even though we make decisions that we wish we didn't, we're created in the image of God with infinite dignity, value, and worth, and, uh, you know, what does the text say? It says, if we won't worship God, even the rocks will cry out, and mm-hmm. I think there is this, like, mm-hmm. kind of, um, it's like when, um, 
when dolphins talk to each other and they talk with that like kind of crazy sound, I think to a certain extent there's something in us, the soul uh, that God has given us, and the text of Scripture. I think it's some of that kind of dolphin callback of like mm-hmm. we're going, oh, this is this is the way it's supposed to be. This is the kingdom mm-hmm. that actually lives forever. This is this is who I really am. And so um, I, I tried to get to it near the end of the message, but. Um, believing the Bible is true, believing the Bible is inspired, believing the Bible is something that God can use in your life is really important. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you believe it and do nothing with it, James would say you're a liar, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we actually have to try it, you know, read it, study it. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we try to give some folks resources for that this weekend. If if you didn't grab those and you're interested in them, campus pastors have Bibles that they'd love to give you. Um, You know, I, I mentioned a book, if you've been walking with God for a long time, called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. I, I recommend it all the time because it's so helpful. Um, but to just sort of break down, here's all the different parts of the Bible. And then if you're that prodigal, if you're really frustrated and you left because you deconstructed, because there were some passages you couldn't explain, uh, Dan Campbell, who was a pastor just here in the area, actually, for a long time, he wrote a book uh, called How Not to Read the Bible. And it takes all of those sort of most controversial things and takes them one at a time and tries to provide some framing to understand why and how God yeah. could possibly do any of that. So. You talked about how the Bible is written in different genres, if you will. Um, would you say that the best resource for that is that how to read a Bible book to figure out, like if I'm just open my Bible to hmm. Hebrews, how do I know what style that is written in and how to read it accordingly. Yeah, for sure. And I think, um, you know, that book is a great, you know, there, there's, there, it's hard in 2033 because what would be easy is for you to just Google it, Yeah. right? But I think that the, the metaphor that Paul gives is the difference between drinking milk as a spiritual baby and, and eating solid food. And so... I'm always trying to like help people think through. You may need milk, and that's okay. And if you need milk, go read that devotional guide about that passage. Go Google it and find a decent commentary that is helpful and free at a site that's reputable. Um, that's great. I, I think there comes a time for followers of Jesus where I want you to start to be able to chew your own food. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think that book starts to help you do it. Uh, as you kind of walk around or you walk through it as you continue down the road, uh, that's going to be like an inductive study Bible. That's going to be um, a specific set of commentaries, which are books written for each book or section of the Bible, so that as you're studying it personally, you're going, I don't know what that means. You can open that up. If you have a study Bible and it has like a little paragraph explaining that, think, what would it look like if these little paragraphs were their own entire book? That's what a commentary is. <laughs> and if you're looking for a set, I don't generally buy commentaries by set because there's always an exception. They're written by different people. Mm-hmm. But if you're looking for a commentary set, uh, the NIV application commentary is a great place to start. Uh, it's very readable. Uh, and even some of the things like uh, Romans is a good example. Doug Moo is a scholar who wrote a really technical, uh, probably three times the size commentary in the book of Romans. And then he wrote the NIV application commentary. And so he's really bringing a huge amount of scholarly weight uh, to the work, but he's intentionally trying to do it in a more uh, readable way that even if you don't know biblical languages uh, can be can be digested. So mm. I'm always trying to help people move. If you, If you need... Hey, I'm going to go read the devotional for this. Go nuts. That's awesome. Um, and if you're ready to sort of go, what is it going to look like for me to come a, become a self-feeder as I read and study the Bible for myself? Uh, I think How to Read the Bible mm-hmm. for All It's Worth by Gordon Fee is, um, so I think that's the, the last name, mm-hmm. um, is a great place to start. Yes. And I want to highlight, too, a resource. Um, if you prefer, and not saying this is better or worse, but if you prefer watching things or listening mm. to things, Bible Project yeah. podcast, fantastic. Dr. Tim Mackey leads that. They have a YouTube channel that has broad overviews sure. that will walk you through like a moving infographic of a study of the book to as deep as if you want seminary level classes, they've released Bible Project classrooms where you can have a 16 hour deep dive into a book study that if you thought that you knew what you're talking about <laughs> or read, you didn't. Right. Yeah. It is yeah. insanely crazy um, how, how deep that like those courses go. And Mm so uh, I think it is uh, a great reminder for us all. I love that analogy of um, milk and food. And I think sometimes we all need milk too, right? Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not, we graduate to, to solid food. 
but there are times in our lives where we're going to just need to go back to milk. <laughs> it's a sometimes. good analogy, but it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And the one takeaway from this weekend that you hoped people would leave with was that the Bible is a true story about a real problem with a profound solution. Yep. Yeah. And I think we're trying to set up, we have one more week in the series. Um, can I know God personally? Mm -hmm. And that's the profound solution. And so mm. I've been doing kind of this a little different at Menlo, but like a very clear, this is what the gospel is every week for the last couple of weeks. Um, I'll yep. do it again this week. Um, but I do it that way on purpose when I'm going to set up an opportunity for people to respond to that. Mm -hmm. uh, I want them thinking about it. I want God sort of like just letting that linger in their head and heart that they might go, okay, what would it mean? What would it mean for me to surrender my life? I couldn't do it. You know, I'm not ready. And um, yeah, I think it's a supernatural thing when, when God moves us to respond. And uh, I love it when people who are people that we would say, oh, no, 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 I, like, I, that, I can't, um, I can't possibly, my life's a mess, you know, and uh, Mark Swarner, campus pastor at Menlo Park, he talked about somebody who's a young man uh, in our church who um, became a Christian recently, and um, a very, very difficult past, very difficult present and future, most likely, involving mm -hmm. uh, criminal justice, and um, uh, very challenging future ahead, and yet he would say, finding Jesus, man, that, that, that's the, the anchor of my life. Mm. And uh, mm. I saw something on Instagram yesterday. I think it's Kat Von D, the lady oh, with, like, all yeah. the tattoos. Yeah. She got baptized oh, yeah, and like, a that. little bitty, uh, like, Baptist church or something. And uh, she was getting so much trash on the mm. Internet, unfortunately, from Christians. And I think we have in our head, mm. like, this is who is allowed to respond mm. And uh, I, I think we, unfortunately, and I talked about this back at Easter, we unfortunately have conditioned in us a pattern that says, if you want to become a Christian, first you behave a certain way, then you believe something, then you can belong. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and in the pattern of Jesus, it's that you belong mm -hmm. because God loves you no matter what, and there's always grace available in the community of saints. Uh, and then eventually you choose to believe something. That's your choice. Mm -hmm. And then it's only after you choose to believe that there would be any necessity of change. Mm -hmm. And so when we, uh, when we flip that, I think we get into a lot of trouble. And so if maybe you've been turned off to faith or you're thinking about coming back to faith or you know somebody who is, um, my encouragement would be Menlo aspires to be the community where you could belong before you believe and where the expectation of change is not behavior modification for the sake of acceptance. Um, it's mm. acceptance because God has already accepted us and loves us for the sake that people might through that hospitality know how much God loves them and that he could do the work because the change that God does in us on the other side of faith, that change is actually transformation. It sticks. Uh, but when we're doing behavior modification, we all know it, right? We've all tried the crash diet. We've all tried the super big swing in some area of our life. Um, and it doesn't last. And so we don't want to, we don't want to <coughs> put that weight onto people. Uh, Jesus said, my uh, yoke is easy and my burden is light. That was in contrast to the teachings of other rabbis at the time. who ad They were adding more. They were saying, oh, here's more for you to do and more for you to do and more for you to do. And Jesus was saying, no, 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 I I'm going to take it all for you. Mm -hmm. And I think um, if we don't understand that, we don't understand the, the core message of Jesus. Yeah. Man. As you were talking, it was kind of coming up in my mind that um, there are different ways in which people interact with each other. As you're sharing that story, there's a way that certain people will interpret Kat Von D getting baptized and some saying that's okay. A lot of people saying like, that's not okay. And I loved how in the, as you were kind of making your second to last point in the message about how saying, um, you know, we're all here at Menlo. We all want people, we, you're not trying to change people's minds or you're not right. trying to get people to think a certain way, right, right. but you're really trying to get all of us in a room together to hold this um, interpretation of scripture in tension with ourselves, with God, with each other. And so how, how does that look like? What does that, how does that play out in a room full of a thousand people or so where you've acknowledged, man, there's people that are going to take this Bible on one side of the spectrum, which is fundamentalist, literal, to the other side of the spectrum, literary, right, metaphorical. How can we, uh, what, what would a healthy community pursue, mm -hmm. pursuing truth look like for us um, 
as we're trying to, to wrestle these things with each other? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think that um, on some level there is, um, I think on some level there's there's something really important about aiming higher than a simple interpretation mm -hmm. of a specific passage, right? Mm -hmm. So we would go, hey, let's go to Genesis 1, right? And we're going to go, hey, how was the world made? That's we're going to have churches that are seven-day, young earth, literal creationists, yeah. and we're going to have churches that are theistic evolutionists. Yeah. Um, and we're I one did. page into the Bible at that point. And we're one page. <laughs> yeah, page <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think being able to recognize, hey, what is the higher value? Uh, I think the higher value in Genesis 1 is that God is the unmoved mover. He's the creator, mm. regardless of how you believe he did it, right? And so you can be a faithful follower of Jesus and have a different interpretation as it relates to how the origin of the world came up. Mm -hmm. And I am regularly convinced that our imagination related to how God could have created the world is so finite mm. that we are likely to get to heaven and no one has the complete answer. Mm -hmm. That he's like, oh, I saw how you guys talked about this. Yeah, yeah, it's actually kind of different than all those, you know? And so I, I don't think that means we shouldn't pursue truth, pursue knowledge, ask for wisdom. We absolutely should. Um, but I think that is a microchasm of this dynamic. Um, you know, I mentioned it this weekend. There, we have this value as a church um, of generous orthodoxy, that we want to be the church that says, hey, we're going to be unified in the essentials. Um, we're going to provide liberty in the non-essentials. We're going we're gonna to provide um, civility in all of it. And I think that sort of the higher value of compassion, civility, and conviction um, I think that's really, really important. And so if you're somebody that's just kind of waiting to spike the football mm. as it relates to a particular scriptural interpretation or, you know, a, a preacher or a pastor or a book or an author uh, is only good once you've figured out that, like, your pet issues align with their interpretations of those pet issues, I would just say aim higher, aim higher. Mm. Um, so as a church, you know, for us to say, what are those things that are going to shape and uh, help us think about the future well? I think it's just so important that we understand um, this higher value that God genuinely loves and wants everybody to know Him. Mm -hmm. um, and what does it mean for us to confess that we can't get there on our own, mm -hmm. that He did it on our behalf, that we're going to choose to follow Him in all of our ways, um, and that that starts today? Uh, I think everything else can kind of flow from that center of gravity of our faith. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I think the other part of it is just being intellectually honest when you do study specific passages, right? Mm -hmm. We're not just picking it up and going, well, we can have different interpretations because we have different interpretations. Like there, there are some things where I just think it's just not intellectually honest, right? Mm -hmm. I would say some of the work right now that's, that's happening around sort of untethering the biblical ethic around um, gender and sexuality, right now I would say some of the debates t to remove a more traditional understanding of that, they're just not intellectually honest. Mm -hmm. And so I want to have a thoughtful conversation about that, and in the future as a church we will actually. Um, but but I, I also want to make sure um, that when we come up against something that like just does not make sense, we can go, look, there's some presuppositions feeding this. We can be kind and charitable in the conversation, but like, let's name what those things are. Or Genesis 1, right, going like, hey, there's a spectrum of things that like make sense, but then there's some stuff that probably falls outside of that. That's weird. As a church, we would say, uh, hey, we're going to go look at some sections in the New Testament that seem to suggest that in that context, um, men could serve in certain roles and women couldn't serve in certain roles. And we want to bring intellectual honesty to that conversation. Go, hey, our interpretation of that is that it was bound to a specific time mm -hmm. and that now it doesn't work that way. And so being able to, I think, come to each one of those, every time you do that, uh, from a place of intellectual honesty, I think people even that disagree with you go, well, thank you for at least telling me what you think and believe, and thank you for sort of showing, Javon talked about this, sort of showing your work. Thanks for uh, mm -hmm. letting me know how you got here, uh, because even if I don't agree with you, at least I know you didn't just parrot what somebody else mm -hmm. said. So I, I think it's uh, sort of an ecosystem of, of a few of those things. Yeah. yeah, I actually listen to a Bible podcast, and there's two hosts, and they... Mark and and Jess? It's called Menlo Midweek. Okay. Um, and they actually differ on 
certain things, like really big things of like creation and all that stuff. But instead of like fighting about it, they try to intellectually explain like why they believe it that way. Mm -hmm. And they always like, you know, in the end come to like, Hey, that's what you believe is what I believe. We're still, we still have this podcast where we're teaching people about the Bible. So you can hold both, I think. And that's where it's cool to like hear Mm -hmm. from other people and learn and understand like, why do you believe it Mm -hmm. that way? Um, and it just also broadens your view and maybe even in the end changes your view Mm -hmm. or your perspective on how you actually do read the Bible. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that there is, um, you know, that there's something so important about recognizing that we, you know, we all have these um, sort of magnetic forces in our moment, mm-hmm. and our magnetic force, not as Christians, just as people, our magnetic moment is to go into echo chambers of people that agree with us. Mm-hmm. And what happens when we do that is um, we will assume the people that are in our tribe agree with us more than they really do. And we will assume people who are not agree with us less than they really do. And uh, I, I just think that sort of exposure is really helpful. Mm. Like it's re- even if you walk away with your mind unchanged, mm-hmm. at least your mind has been informed. Mm-hmm. Has, is this a 21st century issue, Phil? Or have people <laughs> always been um, debating around Jesus's life and ministry about what it meant, what, were, what appropriate action was? Yeah, I, I think uh, certainly people have always been debating it. Certainly, mm-hmm. uh, this is uh, you know when we think about um, e- even right now uh, Palestinians and Jews, and we go like, hey, wh- what is all wrapped up in that? Mm-hmm. It, you look at the way that they would describe their own faith. Take Jesus out of it. Um, you have an entire spectrum of what it would mean within Judaism, from you know um, ultra orthodox to reformed. Reformed in in that construct actually doesn't mean the way we would think about it. It means like sort of the most culturally Jewish usually, Mm. Um, but their religious connection would be the loosest, so they wouldn't follow things like kosher and wear wear a yarmulke and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I think if we understand human behavior that way, of course, like that extends to everything, uh, and it's complicated, right? I do think that something that's different now, and we don't know the implications of it, because of the internet and because Mm -hmm. of social media, um, we are exposed to a lot more than we've ever been exposed, and I don't think we know if we can handle it. Mm. Uh, I think the early returns are mm-hmm. we can't. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And then I think what everybody's concerned for next, right, is that you take AI and potentially um, sort of uh, AI that gets a mind of its own a little bit that can take just a quarter degree turn and now you're not just hearing something, you're hearing f- something from someone that you trust, and it's just a little bit off, but that thing that you're hearing from someone you think you can trust is actually not the, th- the person that you can trust, and how does that feel in the chaos of all of this? There are different thoughts, right? Some people think that it's just going to add so much content to the internet that the things that are high quality are going to rise up even higher, like, oh, of course I want to listen to the Menlo Midweek podcast, because <laughs> Mark and Jess are so incredible, and that's way better than anything else. Uh, or it will be, the, on the more pessimistic side, um, nothing is discoverable, because there's just so much noise. It's like a sewer. And so, yeah, there's probably some good things down there, but you're standing in sewage to find them, um, and they're so not discoverable. And I think we have yet to discover, yes, this has existed for uh, certainly century after century, we have yet to discover the implications of at the rate by which we are adding more and more content to the conversation. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Was there anything else you'd like to add to this conversation? Uh, I mean, I would just encourage folks, you know, we have one more week in this series. Uh, and if you've got somebody in your life that, that doesn't know Jesus and maybe you think, oh, this would be helpful, um, maybe send them a talk from the series or invite them to our final week and, uh, it's not too late. It's not too late. It's not too late. I, I just think that um, yeah, you have no idea of what hangs in the balance of you choosing to actually care about the eternal destiny of a friend or a family member, or teammate, mm-hmm. um, coworker. Don't don't just anesthetize yourself with more scrolling or more Netflix or more work. Um, let God just l- leave that burden on top of you that you might respond to it, um, and then. You know, just a couple weeks, we have a Menlo 150, and so if you've not uh, signed up for that, it's going to be really fun at Woodside High School. If you show up to one of our campuses, you're going to be disappointed because uh, we'll all be at Woodside High School for one service. Uh, you can learn more about that at menlo.church slash menlo150. Um, 
but sign up, sign up, sign up. We'd love to have you there and celebrate 150 Wild. years mm-hmm. as a church. Uh, is a pretty special day. So lots of fun stuff coming up. We're mm-hmm. super thankful for it. Uh, and I would just say, you know, pray for our team. We're uh, we're navigating some big, important conversations. There's always like the work that's in front of us as a church, mm-hmm. and then there's the stuff that we're kind of working on. And um, we are um, navigating. I would say we are at the five yard line football metaphor um, with a lot of big strategic stuff that we've been working on for about nine months, and we're going to start sharing with people here in the next sixty days or so. Uh, and I'm super pumped about it. I think it's going to be great. But we got a lot of work to do, and the other work doesn't go away. Yep. And so just to, to manage time well, and uh, I'm very aware of that, um, but just couldn't be more thankful for what the Lord's doing at Menlo. And uh, there's some, uh, just some stories that feel so special that you kind of, for me, I just, it just humbles me to say, mm-hmm. God, that you would use us. Um, yeah, that you would use us, frail, broken, fallen people, uh, the kid that grew up with a stutter, you know, to be a mouthpiece in this place. Uh, that people who are close to us and far from faith, people who are shaping the future could do it with the identity of Christ being the thing that's shaping them. Man, I'm, I'm pumped for that. So, Talking about Moses or you're talking about Phil? <laughs> <laughs> uh, nice. Yeah, yeah. All right. That's bye, good. everybody. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>